think we can start slowly. Okay. Yeah. Well, welcome all to this session about survey codings. Survey codings is a website that hosts many databases and those databases facilitate so-called long list questions in surveys. And this presentation will elaborate on these databases and the tools we use for these surveys. We have three presentations, one by Maurice Martens from Center Data, one from Verena Ortmans from Geses in Germany, and one from Giovanni Borghesan from the University of Tilburg in the Netherlands. Please be aware that the session is recorded. So if you have any, don't say anything that you don't want to be recorded. That's the best solution. And then if you want to chat with the presenters, please use the chat function in the Zoom. My name is Kea Tijdens and I'm uh, the leader of Work Package 3.2 in the Shock Project. And this work package solely focuses on survey codings. So that's what we present today is our work so far. I'd like to give the word to Maurice now to present his presentation. Um, let's get started. Um, I hope you see my screen. Please not. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, my name is uh, Maurice Wartes. I Maurice, at... sorry. Uh, we could you uh, just add it to the presentation mode? Uh, I shared it to the, the man. I have my screen sharing on. What's the problem? Left side uh, with small parts. It's not in full screen. It's not in full screen, okay. Oh man, that's better. And now the display settings and duplicate the top. Yeah. Okay. That's better then. Sorry about that. Um, my name is Maurice Martis. I work at Center Data in the Netherlands, like Kea just told you. Um, we've been working on uh, surveycodings.org for well, quite some years now. Uh, previously, before uh, our involvement with Shock, it was uh, done under the Ceres project, which is also a European project. Um, and uh, what we do is, uh, well, it's it's all about surveys. So, um, and when you talk about surveys, you talk about questionnaires. So. In questionnaires, they want to ask questions like, how much money do you make? What is your socioeconomic status? How healthy are you? What are your values? Do you eat healthy? Um, and how would you measure such things? Uh, well, obviously by using indicators. So what is your current job or what study did you do? Or what, is, uh, what did you eat yesterday? You want to uh, ask questions so you know about these things you want to measure. Um, you can often use closed answer sets like a, a tree or a list, for example. So if you want to answer what you ate yesterday, I could present you with a, maybe a tree where you say uh, breakfast and then some typical breakfast items and then another with uh, uh, dinner with some typical dinner items or a list of all the food uh, that you can think of maybe. Uh, but 
well, using these things, you, you often have a sort of limited uh, room on your screen or you can only present a limited domain. So therefore you sort of automatically have mismatches if you have many categories that you could uh, uh, answer to these uh, questions. Uh, so what we have is often like open answer sets. So you simply type in your response. So if I ask you, what is your uh, occupation? Uh, not necessarily, you can answer this in a tree mode, uh, but you want to type it in because there are so many uh, uh, occupations you can have. But the problem with that is uh, from in the survey world, the, these open answers need to be classified later uh, to, to some standards so that you can use them later on, these responses uh, in your statistics. Uh, because simply having an open answer response doesn't uh, uh, help you with that. Um, so then what we normally do is afterwards we're going to classify, uh, but there are often problems with that because you have your survey, uh, people responded something and their response might be too broad or too vague, uh, maybe sometimes too specific. Uh, the, the, the response could contain typos, or maybe uh, if you take a few responses together, it's a strange combination. And uh, so afterwards, coding has, has, has some problems. Um, what we try to tackle is uh, using the survey codings method is to provide a large set with classified responses in a lot of languages. Um, and we could use these to, to, to build tools that respondents could uh, use to, well, detect that they have a problem with their response in a way, uh, or automatically code their response. Um, the set that we defined is, is generated and created by, by experts, collected by experts. Uh, and we also version this so that we could easily refer to the, the, the set of codes uh, over time and that, that was used in such and such study. Um, for shock, uh, well, survey codings already existed before shock existed. Uh, we aim to, to, to broaden the user base. So we want to have more people involved. Uh, we want to have more users of the environment, but also involve more experts that can help us uh, make this an even better set. Uh, and we want to also provide more of these indicators. So what we're working on is a religion, regions, food, and also languages, to name a few. Um, we uh, separate this tool into two uh, ends, so a backend. This is sort of the interface for the experts. They, they can define uh, these classified sets. They can manage trees, set up classifications, define uh, synonyms, provide background information. Um, I will now uh, show a short movie of, of what that looks like. I'll try to talk you to it. Uh, so yeah, well, I hope this is good enough to see, but uh, this uh, website is uh, the admin interface and it will start right now, I hope. Yeah. Uh, here you see four of the uh, indicators we had. So level of education, field of education, industry and occupation. Uh, in this codings screen, you could select uh, a country and then uh, it will show you the for this level of education, uh, what, what matches we have. And here you see some backcode information on like the classification they were assigned to this specific education item. Um, well, I won't go into that too deep because there are other people talking about education. Uh, here I move to occupation and there it's it's a slightly different. We can also select an, uh, uh, but, uh, an occupation a title. You could sort of translate uh, and, and therefore I show you here uh, the translation in uh, the Argentinian way or there's also other languages and if you go down a bit, yeah, we could scroll uh, all their translations. Um, we have the context, which is like the definition in which languages we have these things available. 
uh, the, for occupation, we have two classifications defined, the NACE 2004 and ISCO 08 currently. And also the definitions of these classification systems is defined in the uh, back end. Uh, for sources is where we uh, got these uh, items from. Okay, and next we're gonna look at a classification for education. Is get 97. So this is the background information for that classification. And we can go to codings. We see the tree view. This tree view for education is, of course, defined per language because every education system is different. Uh, here you could, in the back end, define what your tree looks like and, and how the uh, system works in that country. Uh, well, this was, of course, the quick look uh, at things uh, uh, for more in depth. I think another time when there's more time. Uh, the other part for survey codings is, is what everybody can see from us uh, uh, in the world. It's the website surveycodings.org. It's just the front end. So there it contains public information. Uh, you can download the sets. Uh, there are some demo questionnaires there for each of the provided sets. There's a live search. And it's also, uh, uh, well, the gateway to, to an API that you could use to uh, run with the things what we defined. And also for that, I have a little movie. Let's play that one. So here is the front end. Everybody can go to this website. You see we have an overview uh, question module uh, where you can download the questionnaire, which uh, has uh, an example in. Uh, levels of education, fields of education, occupation. Well, it's, it's the same items you just saw. Uh, and every one of these has the database live search and it runs on the same database that you just saw, but then on the public version the, the, that is published. Uh, people can easily uh, look in the search box, uh, find a match here that in, uh, to a certain, and it jumps to the admin interface to show you some background information if you'd like. Uh, then there's a search tree that was dynamically defined in the uh, backends. And also this works, you can use this to go to the public side of the admin. Uh, then we have some background information on how to implement this in your own survey. So this uh, shows you how to talk to the API. And this has some examples here. Uh, and it will show you uh, some JSON exports, I think. So if you click on these, you see what the API gives back and uh, you could play around with this, say that you want to change the search to, to bug here and it uh, shows you the results you would get. Um, but this is more, more computer stuff than really um, uh, user-friendly. Um, another thing is that we have built an app to uh, demonstrate these things. It's, well, it is a web app here because I, I could not show a real app. Um, and uh, the, the, you can download this on, on the Google Play Store, but uh, it basically has the same functionality as what you just uh, saw with the database live search. It, it, you could uh, load in uh, co uh, coding sets and, and it find a match, you could uh, load uh, the tree in and it will uh, show you also uh, what a classification is attached to, to, to this. So there's an alternative approach on, on asking uh, uh, the codings. So I uh, could load in new ones, we could delete an old one. Okay, I'm gonna set up the app for uh, education now with a version one because there are different versions available for Algeria and then it shows the tree in Algerian. So these are, are all based on the same data model and uh, same structure. Um, so uh, oh, what did I do? Wrong one. Um, so I already did it. Okay, I'm also at the end of my presentation already. I'm so quick. Um, 
And I think, uh, well, what we do now is talk, uh, show you two other uh, people who uh, are involved in broadening this uh, platform. So uh, I'm not sure who's next. Please not. Giovanni, I think yeah. next. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, he will talk about uh, the steps we will make to also include uh, religion, uh, I think. So I'm going to stop my share. So, hello everybody. Um, today I'm going to talk about the religious denomination classification and database. Me, Daniela Negoita, Chiara de Siena, and Ruth Lajux from the European Value Study in Tilburg are working on this project. Just to give a bit of context on who we are, the European Value Study is a cross-national, cross-national survey, cross-sectional, cross-national survey that runs every nine years since 1981. We reached up to 47 countries. In the last wave, we filled in 34. And the topics range from family to politics, morality and, of course, religiosity. So feel free to visit our channels. But going back to the project, our goal is to offer a flexible tool for researcher, as uh, showed by Maurice before. So a predefined set of response categories for survey questions that would allow researchers to have consistent and comparable data across countries. So the final aim would be to translate each religious denomination in the languages that are uh, spoken in the countries where these religions are practiced. Uh, why is this important? Because, well, um, if you are uh, a researcher of religious denominations and you want to work with survey, surveys, this is the situation that you find yourself in. So different surveys with different set of codes and different set of labeling. And so uh, spending time in harmonizing and recording uh, everything. So our final result will be as was shown before. So in this case, a researcher would choose what is the country that he wants to investigate and download the set of response categories. I'm using a, an example for education, but Verena will show you better later. And how are we going to do this? The data structure is going to take the form of a translation matrix with the rows being countries and the religious denominations themselves and the columns being countries and the languages spoken in those countries. Um, now we face some challenges in the while we are working on this project. The first one is identifying the relevant religious denominations for each country and all the languages that are spoken in this country. So the sources to use and the denominations to include. Secondly, the classification, how deep do we want it? Because as we said, we want a tool that is flexible and allowing researchers to investigate the differences between Christians and Muslim, but also within Christian subdenominations, for instance. And thirdly, the translation. So which languages should we include? For the first problem, we um, gather the list of religious denominations from representative social surveys. So the one that you see in the list in this slide, but we um, are enriching this list by substituting the other categories with other religious denominations that may not be captured by surveys, but are included in uh, official statistics such as censuses or other uh, research. Uh, then the classification. Uh, luckily, a thorough classification already exists, is the one that you see in this screenshot from the Onbound project. We are in contact with these um, people to cooperate and have a set of code that would allow to merge the two projects and take the best out of the two. Uh, thirdly, the translation. Um, the problem is that there is no instrument that contains all languages. Uh, Google Translate, despite being highly trained, don't contain, doesn't contain them all, nor other uh, instruments. And also there is a methodological point that is, uh, what about minor languages? The example of the Creoles in the Caribbean archipelagos, for instance, that change 
um, everywhere or the languages of countries um, like overseas territories of European countries, for instance, that are usually excluded a priori by survey researches and hence should, should them be included or not in light of future comparability. We are still working on it. And um, if there are questions, I would uh, be happy to answer. Otherwise, I prepared a practical example on how we would implement this project with Italy. Okay, we'll move on. So in the first instance, we would gather the list of religious denomination. We would start uh, with the European Social Survey in this case. As you see, there is a vast majority of Roman Catholic and then if we want to go deeper, we use the Censur, that is the Center of Studies for New Religions in Italy, and we gather this list. And as you can see, those are uh, very minor denominations uh, compared to the um, uh, ones that are captured by social surveys. And we arrive to our uh, final list. Um, here it is. As you see, though, some of the um, groups are kind of broad. Um, hence, the second step is to substitute this very broad list uh, with the specific subdenominations. And finally, we would add the codes for, uh, from the Unbound project for uh, allowing to work on this data properly. Uh, the last step that would remain is the translation and hence we would ins uh, add this list to the translation matrix that I showed before. The official recognized languages, is the official language in, in Italy is Italian, but there are also other uh, language minorities. And hence in this case, you see that the list has the translation of each religion in the other languages that are uh, uh, include, uh, existing in Italy. And that's it from my side. Thanks for uh, your attention. Uh, yeah. uh, Giovanni, may I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, the locale for French in Italy is not IT underscore FR, but the other way around. FR oh. underscore IT. Okay. So I made the this last example. two characters. Sorry. And, and you can Google um, Java, so there's a Java website. Maurice will certainly know this. There's a, uh, for the Java programming language, there's a site where they present all these locales. So okay. you could Google it there. In, in the original okay. matrix, it's, co it's correct as we prepared it. It's just that I made this fictionary example for the presentation and I made oh, okay. it. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. <laughs> My bad. But it sounds really interesting. Thanks. Okay. Um, shall we go to Verena? Verena, can you start? Uh, I will try to um, share my slides. <laughs> Do you see this in full screen now? Yeah, okay, yeah. Good, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Kea. Um, my name is uh, Verena Ottmanns. I'm working at Gases Leibniz Institute for the Social Sciences in Mannheim in Germany. And today I will talk about um, two tools we developed uh, for, for measuring education. Um, and this is a uh, joint work together with uh, Silke Schneider. Um, I will firstly speak about some background and give you a background on, on measuring education and a little bit also on education in more general. Before I will then present uh, the two tools we developed, one for measuring fields of education and the other one for measuring levels of education. And then I will also uh, speak about future work um, within shock. Um, so starting with, with the background information. Um, 
education or in social sciences, when we speak about education, we usually, we usually refer to uh, the construct of educational attainment, meaning the highest formal educational program um, respondents have completed. And next to um, age and sex, education is one of the most central background variables in surveys um, we have. And education is also a key predictor and also a control for many other outcomes. Um, we use it quite often, for instance, with regard to measuring uh, social status, human capital, um, social capital. And education is also quite often used as a proxy variable for instance, for cognitive skills. Uh, but we also know that measuring education, especially in cross-national surveys, is quite challenging. And I will indicate this also on the next slide. Um, with regard to measuring education, uh, we distinguish between measuring level of education and fields of education. So when measuring the level of education, we refer to the hierarchical differentiation of different educational pro uh, programs. Um, the survey question for this is, what is your highest educational qualification? Uh, but what is quite difficult here, especially in cross-national surveys, is that we have uh, different educational systems across the countries, which also have their own institutions, um, and we have to mirror that when, when asking this question. Um, with this, we also cannot really translate the um, educational certificates awarded. And therefore, when asking this question in a survey, uh, we usually apply ex ante output harmonization, meaning we ask with, uh, we use the uh, country specific names of the qualifications and later on um, to, to um, compare them, we code all of them into an international standard classification. Um, with regard to fields of education, here we mirror more the horizontal differentiation. And here the question uh, that's typically asked in the surveys is, what is the main subject area of your highest qualification? And this is difficult to measure uh, because we have a large number of different fields of education. And we also have the difficulty of self-classification into broader categories that are commonly offered um, in surveys. Um, to measure uh, feats of education and level of education, we in the last years developed um, tools for this. And with regard to uh, the tool of um, on educational level, uh, this was developed within the Comcast project and also extended in the um, CERES project. And we now can offer uh, this tool for roughly 100 countries. And uh, the tool for feats of education, which now covers roughly uh, 35 languages, was developed uh, within the CERES project. And now we are happy that we get an extension uh, to work uh, more on this uh, project, uh, to work more on these databases and on these tools uh, within the CHOC uh, project. Um, and now I want to introduce you to the components um, we have uh, in this, uh, for these uh, tools. And this is first of all the questionnaire module. Um, here we firstly have to identify the relevant educational system uh, for the respondent and then we ask them more specifically on the highest educational qualification they have obtained or uh, about their main field of education. And then we have the survey interfaces, um, we call them combination box, this is an open uh, box where they can type in their qualification. And there's an uh, algorithm in the background that also does some text string matching. And I will show you a screenshot later on for this. And the second interface is the search tree. This is a dynamic list of different levels, um, which also contains the information on qualification and fields of education. Uh, and the last component um, are the databases. Um, here we have one database per concept in which we define uh, the universe and provide international codes for all the uh, qualifications or fields of education mentioned. And this database also contains the information on the structure of the interfaces, especially for the search tree. So now let's uh, look a little bit more deeply in the uh, tool for fields of education first. Um, the database here um, contains uh, the really the names of the fields of education and training. And these are really in line uh, with the um, international standard classification for education. 
of education for fields of education and training, sorry. This is the ISCAT F classification. And here we have uh, three, uh, this is a three level classification. And on the first level, there are the 11 broad fields. On the second level, we find roughly uh, 13 narrow fields. And um, on the third level, which is really the detailed information, we have about 80 different fields of um, education. And what is good here is that we can use the same entries for all countries because we can translate the fields of education. And this is differ with regard to level of education. Um, here you see the um, main uh, categories or the broad fields, the first level um, of the ISCAT F classification. Uh, for instance, we find here arts and humanities um, or health and welfare. And here we see the search tree for fields of education here for France. Uh, here we also have arts and humanities. And on the second uh, level, we distinguish between arts, humanities, and languages. And on the third level, we more deeply got the information if it's dealt with linguistics and literature or, or if it's with acquisition of a language. Now I want to speak a little bit more about the second tool, which is on levels of education and training. Uh, the database here contains uh, the educational qualifications, and these um, differ uh, across countries to mirror and reflect the um, country spe uh, specifics um, of the educational system. As indicated, we cannot translate them. And each of the qualification we have is also linked to an international classification, and here we offer the ISCAT codes for uh, 1997, 2011, and also the harmonized education variable of the ESS, which is the EDU level B variable. Um, here we see the combination box here uh, for Spain. You can, for instance, type in bachillerato and then you get uh, four suggestions and you can just select one. Uh, but you can also, if it does not fit, you can just uh, go on typing and uh, what you type in is then stored. And then we have a second interface, which is the search tree, also here for Spain. And here you see all uh, different educational levels we have in the database. Um, and they are ordered hierarchically from no education, primary education, secondary education, higher and then university education. And here you see again for bachillerato, all the opportunities, uh, all the certificates here and a lot of opportunities for the uh, respondent to, to uh, select one. And this interface um, comes automatically uh, after uh, there was no match within the first um, within the first interface of the combination box. Then respondents automatically get the search tree. But for non-Latin scripts, uh, we only offer this search tree as a solution here. Um, we also did some validation of um, this um, this tool. Um, and here we looked at data um, of the um, socioeconomic sample, especially of the sample of the migrants and refugees. Um, and here we could, um, we had three different instruments that measured immigrants' uh, homeland education. That was firstly uh, years of schooling variables. So respondents were directly asked, indicating their um, time they spent at school. Then there was a um, sub instrument, which was a, it offers generic descriptions of different educational levels, such as compulsory school. And then we have the very detailed uh, country specific list of educational qualifications as I presented uh, um, before. And what we see here is the predictive power. Um, we find um, when predicting um, immigrants German language skills. Um, and here we control for age and sex and um, run uh, different regressions uh, with the uh, education variables and we found that the years of schooling has the lowest predictive power and the highest predictive power is um, uh, comes from the sub uh, with the CAMCAS um, tool and the sub also performs quite well quite similar result but what's important is if we want to compare the CAMCAS and the sub measure then we have to aggregate them and came up with variables distinguishing six or three categories. We see that the CAMCAS tool loses a lot of information and therefore the predictive power is uh, smaller than and the sub still has a quite high predictive power here. 
Okay, and uh, last, I want to add a few words about future work uh, within the CHOC project. We plan to update these databases for fields of education and also for levels of education, um, especially in order to consider changes that have um, been made in educational system. I think this applies mainly to Poland and Turkey. Um, and we also plan to extend the databases for levels of education by adding some more countries uh, which are still missing, for instance, China, uh, Colombia, and South Africa. And in general, we will also want to add some more background information on the tools and other material, for instance, like uh, videos in order to explain a little bit more these tools and um, to promote them also a little bit more to, to other communities and tell them how to, to implement these. Yeah, and then I'm done. Thank you very much. And now I'm looking forward for your questions. Thank you so much, Verena. There have been, I don't see that there has been one question from Irina, but that did not address Verena specifically or Giovanni. It addressed whether the issue whether we will have more ontologies in the survey codings. And then I can tell you that there are still two other ontologies. Um, on the to-do list. The first one is regions. So many surveys want to have the provinces or the cities in the provinces in the survey. And so I'm working for, for Wage Indicator and Wage Indicator is a global institute that runs global surveys in the national languages in many countries. And we have for several tools, we have the region search tree where any visitor can select first the province within the country and then the cities within the country and there are mapping tables to the nuts, nuts classifications so that is one and then the other ontology that we are preparing is a food items ontology this is not an ontology that meets Maurice's start question, what did you eat today or yesterday? But it aims to measure the prices of the most relevant food products uh, in order to uh, get sufficient calories per day. So it has approximately 80 food items as well as some other items. And that is also translated and countries have also some food specific, um, some country specific food items. So that is the second ontology that we are developing. Um, are there any more questions? Did I see more questions? I don't think so. Okay. There are no more questions, but I, but I, I I'm, can I pose another one? Yes, uh, if I can. So I was I was looking uh, uh, whether I'll find some information about the usage, so the licenses for the survey coding. So my question goes in the direction: if I'm um, if I as a company offer uh, web uh, surveys. Um, am I allowed to, to you know, implement uh, yeah. to, my, uh, to my program so uh, that others can use it? Yes, you are. Or maybe Maurice wants to answer. Uh, I can answer uh, a bit. Um, yeah, yes, uh, as far as uh, we know, you are. It's... it's uh, uh, there are no rights on occupation titles or per se. Um, and also uh, we provide the, the API uh, that people can uh, connect to. And uh, it doesn't matter if you're from uh, science or from the industry, uh, does it doesn't really matter. Um, uh, I think, well, part of the shock project is also to make it a bit more clear uh, how the legal stuff works. So we're still a bit work working on that as well. Um, but then again, that's not my department, so 
uh, maybe you should uh, invite some other people to address mm -hmm. that. Yeah, basically the idea is, so we have developed this with public money. So therefore it is free. Um, so in any, any web survey agency that wants to set up a web survey and ask for whatever occupation or education or religion whatsoever, they can use our tools for free. They, we hope that they quote us properly, but that's basically it. Yeah, that's, uh, thank you. That's one thing, as, as Marie said, it would be, um, I think, welcome to have this information on, on the web as well, so it clarify uh, this uh, usage perspective, because I think it's really useful, especially the tools that are offering international um, support uh, that they could use this, uh, what you developed now. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes, it's really targeting multi-country surveys. That is our full, our aim. Or in the case of what Forena said, uh, when we want to measure migrants' education within a country. So then there's also a kind of multi-country uh, approach. Are there any more questions? Don't think so. No. Then I'd, I'd like to thank all the presenters. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I did, at least. Um, Irina, can I give the word to you to close? Yes, thank you. So I would like to thank you all to, to prepare uh, this session. Uh, the recording will be available in, in, the, um, in the conference, uh, also platform, but also on the shock webpage. And uh, yeah, if you have any further questions, uh, please send them to, to the team. So the slides will be also available with the information how to reach them. Uh, in this regard. And uh, yes, this is for now. And try to follow us in, in the shock project where I'm sure there will be more to tell about the, the survey codings. Yeah. That's right. Thank okay. you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you very yeah. much. Okay, and bye bye. I, and I should say uh, nice greetings also from Silke because I did not have the opportunity earlier on <laughs> due to recording. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, she could not make it. Uh, okay. She was ill the last week and then she has a lot of duties to do this week and therefore she.